we go. Uh, so, Rainy, um, the first question that I've got for you really is, if you could describe the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, and the work that you do. So, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is going on 22 years old. We are a uh, law firm and also an advocacy center. Uh, we deal with issues uh, in the intersection of technology and civil liberties. So we deal primarily with free speech, innovation, and privacy. Uh, and we, we kind of serve several different roles. Uh, we do impact litigation, so we actually go to courts where we believe a case can make a big difference and litigate uh, on behalf of users and uh, innovators online. And we also uh, build technologies that actually help individuals better protect their privacy uh, when they use uh, the Internet. Uh, such as HTTPS Everywhere is a Firefox add-on that we made. Um, and then we have a, uh, a policy branch, which um, primarily works overseas um, uh, in Europe that uh, does a lot of negotiations with uh, European regulators uh, around uh, various Internet standards and privacy issues and treaties and so on and so forth. A lot of that is a little bit more behind the scenes. Um, and then we have a grassroots advocacy and education uh, campaigns, and that's what I work on. I'm the head of the activism team, uh, and we do uh, a whole range of issues, but trying to teach Internet users about why digital issues and digital civil liberties matter to them and how they can get involved in helping to preserve rights so that uh, years from now the Internet is a place that uh, uh, it tolerates free speech and privacy and innovation. Wonderful. So uh, how would you, just to give an overview, how would you describe uh, the internet and privacy today? What, what do you think are the, the biggest issues that we face there today? So uh, privacy is particularly interesting. Uh, it's actually such a moving target. Uh, right now, with the Internet sort of blossoming in the way it has been over the last few years, we've reached a point where a few factors have really affected um, data storage. Um, and what you have is the ability of companies to take and easily collect just absolutely vast quantities of data of individuals. And some of it is non-identifiable and arguably not that important. And some of it is extremely sensitive data from medical records to uh, personal communications uh, with other people in your family to what have you. Um, and uh, different companies online actually serve as intermediaries that collect all this information, whether it's your ISP or Google or various apps that are interacting with your Facebook page, all of these different companies um, have the ability to store, to collect it, and storage has become extremely cheap. So they're not getting rid of it. Uh, it is storage by default, whereas uh, historically, in the, the annals of human knowledge, we've sort of deletion was the, uh, the de facto way that we handled things. You had it for a certain amount of time, and unless you really worked at it, you, you, it was lost or you had to pay to keep it on. Uh, now deletion, uh, deletion is the exception, not the rule. Data tends to hang along for quite a long time, and corporate intermediaries serve as a, sort of a points in which data can be collected and stored for literally years and years. Very little knowledge from consumers about uh, exactly who's got what data on them or any real control about uh, how they can stop it from being collected or, uh, uh, you know, other than simply not using the Internet, which is frankly not an option. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of happening on the corporate side. And on the government side, we have um, uh, changes in laws that have uh, made it easier for the government to access uh, uh, sensitive uh, communications under, for example, the Patriot Act. I'm sorry, I don't know too much about overseas laws of that nature. Um, and we also have um, uh, uh, the ability, uh, frequency that the government um, is is going to online intermediaries like Facebook or Google or or what have you, and and asking them for data. Um, this can happen in a couple of ways. It can be sort of a friend relationship, like, hey, would you mind hanging on to some data for us for a while, and then and later coming back with more formal documentation like a warrant, or there might be, in certain circumstances, uh, a, a, a company can actually voluntarily share information with the government, 
or simply the, the company had the information and was able to then, uh, uh, the, the government was able to put pressure on it to, to get that information. So you have these sort of different factors, one in which companies are able to collect a huge amount of data uh, from users um, and users can't even really stop it from occurring, and two, governments uh, seeing the ability to pressure these companies to, to uh, take more data for consumers. So you have a uh, basically a surveillance culture that's being created uh, even as we build one of the most uh, um, amazing pieces of technology imaginable, which is the Internet, which uh, is supposed to promote uh, free speech and, and connection between worlds uh, and now, it, and also, unfortunately, is being misused uh, as a spying tool. So I would say that would be one of the big issues <laughs> in sure. privacy right now today. Yeah, for sure. And how do you feel ordinary internet users view privacy today? Do you think they take their the issues around their privacy seriously enough? Are they aware of the issues that there are with it? So that's an interesting question. There's, um, there's this mythology about kids not really caring about privacy. Uh, and in fact, uh, from what we've looked at uh, in uh, academic studies, this is not exactly true. Um, kids seem to have a higher um, risk tolerance. So they, uh, if they understand the privacy issue, they have a, a, a more willingness to, to, to make a decision to say, well, in this instance, what I will get out of you know, not having my privacy is worth it, whereas uh, some other age groups might not have that. Um, risk evaluation. But in fact, uh, young folk are much more likely to go in and, for example, change their Facebook privacy settings. Uh, they're more willing to use the tools available to them to safeguard certain pieces of information and actually go through a fairly elaborate strategies to safeguard um, data. So that's some one area that academic researchers have shed some light on. If you're interested in it, I would really recommend looking at uh, the work of Dana Boyd, B-O-Y-D. She's really written some extraordinary things on this issue. And Chris Hoofnagel, H-O-O-F-N-A-G-L-E, at Berkeley. He does great work on that as well. Um, so then there's sort of the larger issue, well, what about regular consumers? And I think um, the general Internet user uh, has certain privacy expectations and often doesn't realize that companies aren't meeting them. So, for example, in studies it seems that people see that a website has a privacy policy and therefore believes that their privacy is protected, um, which is actually not true. Uh, it's <laughs> um, so we, we see things like that where consumers have much higher expectations about what kind of uh, legal and technical protections are available to them, and um, they perhaps use these services online without recognizing the fact that their data actually is often being shared in ways they aren't expecting, with marketing affiliates, with uh, what have you, with the government in certain circumstances, or simply not safeguarded well against uh, intrusive hackers or what have you. So, so we have this sort of expectation of a certain amount of privacy, um, and what comes across as a nonchalance about it when people use the Internet. They're so excited about the tools that allow them to connect with individuals that they don't think through, uh, okay, maybe I should sit down and actually read a privacy policy. Um, and I think that what happens is individuals don't realize the big ramifications to their personal privacy until something happens to make it a reality for them in a real visceral level. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it shouldn't, it, it, it takes sort of a dramatic moment when you uh, see uh, personal information posted online or uh, suffer a data breach or what have you to really drive it home for people and it shouldn't. Um, and uh, having even if you do hit that point of recognition, oh my gosh, you know, I've, I've really lost control of a great wealth of personal data. Uh, it's hard for a consumer, unless they want to spend literally hours working at it, um, to, uh, to, to do anything effectively to control their, um, their personal information and the flow of data uh, if they want to continue to use technology.